Okay, switching gears a little bit. Um, you've worked alongside many of the greats of our generation. Um, Sam, Greg from OpenAI and the rest of the OpenAI team, Elon Musk. Uh, Elon shared this at our last base camp. So you have two teams. Um, the Japanese team has four rowers and one steerer. And the American team has four steerers and one rower. And can anyone guess when the American team loses, what do they do? They fire the rower. And, and Elon shared this example, I think, as a reflection of how he thinks about hiring the right people, building the right people, building the right teams at the right ratio. Um, from working so closely with these incredible leaders, what have you learned? Uh, yeah, so I would say definitely Elon runs his companies in extremely unique style. I don't actually think that people appreciate how unique it is. You sort of like even read about it and so much, you don't understand it, I think. <laughs> it's like even hard to describe. I don't even know where to start, but it's a, like a very unique, different thing. Like I, I like to say that he runs the biggest startups. I don't even know basically like how to describe it. It almost feels like it's a longer set of thing that I have to think through. But well, number one is like, so he likes very small, strong, highly technical uh, teams. Uh, so that's number one. So um, I would say at companies by default, they sort of like the teams grow and they get large. Uh, Elon was always like a force against growth. I would have to work and expend effort to hire people. I would have to like basically plead to hire people. Um, and then the other thing is that big companies, usually you want, um, it's really hard to get rid of low performers. And I think uh, Elon is very friendly to by default getting, getting rid of low performers. So I actually had to fight for people to keep them on the team uh, because he would by default want to uh, remove people. And so uh, that's one thing. So keep a small, strong, highly technical team. Uh, no middle management that is kind of like uh, non-technical for sure. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is kind of like the vibes of how this is, how everything runs and how it feels when he sort of like walks into the office. He wants it to be a vibrant place. People are walking around, they're pacing around, uh, they're working on exciting stuff, they're charting something, they're coding. You know, He doesn't like stagnation, he doesn't like to look for it to look that way. He doesn't like large meetings. He always encourages people to like leave meetings if they're not being useful. Uh, so actually you do see this, or you know, it's a large meeting and some, if you're not contributing and you're not learning, you just walk out. And this is like fully encouraged. And I think this is something that you don't normally see. So I think like vibes is like a second big lever that I think he really instills in culturally. Uh, maybe part of that also is like, I think a lot of big, com big companies, they like pamper employees. I think like there's much less of that. It's like the, the culture of it is you're there to do your best technical work and there's the intensity and, and so on. And I think maybe the last one that is very unique and very interesting and very strange is just how connected he is to the team. Uh, so usually a CEO of a company is like a remote person five layers up who talks to their VPs, who talk to their, you know, reports and directors, and eventually you talk to your manager. And it's not how you're as companies, right? Like he will come to the office, he will talk to the engineers. Um, many of the meetings that we had were like, uh, okay, um, 50 people in the room with Elon, and uh, uh, he talks directly to the engineers. He doesn't want to talk just to the VPs and the directors. Uh, so I, you know, um, normally people would talk, spend like 99% of the time maybe talking to the VPs. He spends maybe 50% of the time and he just wants to talk to the engineers. So if, if the team is small and strong, then engineers and the code are the source of truth. And so they have the source of truth, not some manager. And he wants to talk to them to understand the actual state of things and what should be done to improve it. Uh, so I would say like the degree to which he's connected with the team and not something remote is also unique. And, um, and also just like his large hammer and his willingness to exercise it within the organization. So maybe if he talks to the engineers and they bring up that, you know, what's blocking you? Okay, I, I just, I don't have enough GPUs to run my thing. And he's like, oh, okay. And if he, see, if he hears that twice, he's gonna be like, okay, this is a problem. So like, what is our timeline? And when, when you don't have satisfying answers, he's like, okay, I want to talk to the person in charge of the GPU cluster. And like someone dials the phone and he's just like, okay, double the cluster right now. <laughs> <laughs> like let's let's have a meeting tomorrow. From now on, send me daily updates until the cluster is ha twice the size. And then they kind of like push back, and they're like, okay, well, we have this procurement set up, we have this timeline, and Nvidia says that we don't have enough GP uh, GPUs, and it will take six months or something. And then you get a rise of an eyebrow, and then he's like, okay, I want to talk to Jensen, and then he just kind of like removes bottlenecks. So I think the extent to which he's like extremely involved and removes bottlenecks and applies his hammer, I think is also like not appreciated. So I think there's like a lot of these kinds of aspects that are very unique, I would say, and very interesting. And honestly, like going to a normal company outside of that is, is uh, you, you definitely miss aspects of that. 